This episode of Smart People Podcast is supported by Sidekick by HubSpot. With Sidekick, you can get powerful contact insight right in your inbox. Sidekick seamlessly integrates with your email so you can receive live notifications when someone opens and clicks on your emails and schedule emails to be sent when you're offline. Go to GetSidekick.com slash smart people to get your first month of Sidekick for free. Try it out. Sidekick is awesome. And now on to the show podcast where we talk to smart people but not necessarily done by smart people that is an awesome question this one goes down probably on one of my top five hey i like nutrition i like to eat food this is the coolest thing ever we're gonna do this forever i wish i paid more attention in that class you know i'm gonna be honest i don't understand that as a man i just i don't get it welcome to smartpeoplepodcast.com Hello, welcome. This is Smart People Podcast. I'm Chris Stemp, and I'm so excited for you to be here today. I don't quite know how to approach the episode this week, and here's why. We are interviewing Dr. Stephen Camerata. He is a child development expert and a professor in the Department of Hearing and Speech Sciences at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He's the author of a brand new book called The Intuitive Parent, Why the best thing for your child is you. Now, here's why the cautious intro. As many of you know, I am a new dad, four-month-old son. Love it. It's challenging, though. So many of you are thinking, oh, here we go. He's going to start interviewing all these parenting experts. Well, that wouldn't be a bad idea, but that's not the case. I actually, Dr. Camerata's publicity team reached out to me, and I was like, okay, I guess, if you're going to tell me how to raise my kid. But then I realized most of us, the majority of us at some point or another will have a pretty important relationship with children, you know, either as a parent, a sibling, a uncle, godfather, grandparent. So why not spread a little bit more knowledge around the world? Plus, if you're a teacher or someone who works with kids, this episode definitely helps uncover some of the things behind childhood development, learning styles, ADD, ADHD, mental disabilities, etc. Okay, that's the first caveat. The second is that I have brought my wife onto the show today, something that I promised I wouldn't do, and nothing against her, she's amazing, I love her, but I've listened to other podcasts where they incorporate their wife And sometimes I'm not a huge fan because, well, you're used to my style of asking questions. But she's seen me do this podcasting thing for like five years now. She has a master's degree in early childhood development. She's a kindergarten teacher and now a brand new mom. So I thought, if anything, she could hear it, be part of it, and she does impart a little wisdom on us. But anyways, I digress. So as I mentioned, we're interviewing Dr. Camerata about his book, The Intuitive Parent, as well as really what he knows as a child development expert and father of seven. What the heck? How do you do that? Dr. Camerata received his PhD from Purdue University. Postdoctoral appointments have been held at University of Arizona, University of California, San Diego. He's held faculty positions at Penn State and at UC Santa Barbara. You know, really extensive background, all dealing with children, their development. So it was a treat to have him on, especially to get a few parenting tips. A couple additional housekeeping issues that you might really want to know about. If you listened to our last episode, that was episode 203 with Adrian Gostick, you might be interested in what motivates you. Well, I have some good news. Adrian was kind enough to give us 10 free passes to take his motivational questionnaire and get a full write-up on your motivation style. Typically, this costs, I believe they said $40, although the book is like $20 and you get it there. Regardless, it's not free and we're giving them away for free. So as usual, make sure you head on over to smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for our newsletter. That's where we do these giveaways. That's where we give the instructions, connect with you, and try and really hook you up. So smartpeoplepodcast.com, sign up for the newsletter at the bottom right hand of the webpage. Just scroll all the way down there. Additionally, we've had a lot of emails recently. Podcasting is blowing up. People want to get in this game. Uh, It wasn't something John and I considered doing, but people really want some advice on podcasting. 
And eventually it's turned to businesses that want us to make their podcast for them. So John and I now have set up a little consulting arm here and uh, we are creating podcasts for some businesses here in D.C. Um, and a few others that aren't local because you don't need to be local anymore. If that's something you're interested in, maybe you're a small business owner, maybe you're an entrepreneur, a solopreneur, and you basically want us to set up your podcast, consult you on how long, how to do it, what type of logo, what type of title, what type of structure, really how to get the most out of it, audio, editing, everything. We will create your first couple episodes, depending on what you want. We will also train you on how to do it. Really, the whole shebang. I'm not trying to pitch you. It's just, if it's something you're interested in, we've been getting emails. Just go to consulting.com smartpeoplepodcast.com. There's a little splash page and you can shoot us an email through there and we'll really custom tailor this thing to you so that you can go from no idea what you're doing to fully functional podcast with a number of completed podcasts within a month. So anyways, that's the end of that. All right, here it is. Going to turn it over to me and my wife, Heather, interviewing Dr. Camerata uh, about childhood development what makes the baby brain tick, and how do we not screw up our kids? Specifically, how do I not screw mine up? Here it is. Hope you enjoy. All right. Well, Stephen, thank you so much for being on the show. I, I really appreciate it. As many of the listeners know, um, I have a, a new baby boy. He's four months old. And so when I saw your book, The Intuitive Parent, and when I realized I'd had the chance to talk to you, of course, I jumped on it. So again, thanks for being on the podcast. It's really my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So I want to first start off and, and learn a little bit more about what you do. I know you have a PhD in child development. And, you know, of course, for anyone who has kids, is thinking about having kids, they want to speak to the expert. So we have a chance to do so. And I wanted to know... What is it like to be an expert in this? What have you had to do, and what is your background like? Sure, yeah, so there's, there's, there's kind of two sides to that expertise. Um, so in terms of my um, academic background and, and then, you know, the professional work I do, my Ph.D. is in, um, it's in speech and hearing sciences. You know, I work with children with disabilities, um, everything from babies to young adults and everything in between. And then I, um, I did a postdoctoral fellowship on that. I have clinical certification in speech language pathology and have professional credentials in diagnosing and treating speech and language disorders in children with various kinds of disabilities, including Down syndrome, autism, ADHD, and, and so on. On the personal side, um, I've been blessed to have and raise seven children of my own. I have four boys and three girls. So I kind of a mixture of both practical experience and then professional and in the scientific arena, I'm, I'm a clinical translational scientist, so um, I do most of my work is really on early identification um, and then also developing better treatment methods for children with disabilities, mm -hmm. but then also that I interface with um, neurosciences, and um, one of the things we're very interested in is, you know, when, we, when a child learns something, then what impact does that have on their brain architecture? So I work with colleagues who are um, frontline neuroscientists in that area. So there's so many things there that interest me. And the first that just kind of jumped out, so I'm going to run with it, is you talked about early identification of mental illnesses that, that children might have. Was that something you, you do? Yeah, so we, we call them developmental disabilities, although they do come under um, mental illness, uh, mental health typologies when they're classifying them in the professional organizations. Um, but yeah, I, I do do that. The long and the short of it is if a child is late to begin speaking, um, it could be normal variation. Some children start speaking late and there's really no clinical condition. Or it could be a sign of autism. It could be a sign of a language disorder. It could be a sign of a slow learning, you know, intellectual disability. Um, and so it's really important for clinicians to kind of understand, you know, what's going on when a child's behind in terms of their ability to begin talking and then what kind of treatment might be needed for it. The treatment for autism, for example, is very different than the treatment for a language disorder. Mm. And so it's important to understand that and, and, and be able to identify that, differentiate that early on. Stephen, I had a question for you with regard to the age of the children that you notice these disabilities kind of coming to life. It really depends on the severity and nature of the of the challenge, the developmental challenge. So 
with someone like Down syndrome, um, oftentimes you'll see at birth that the child's Down syndrome. Um, there are certain features of Down syndrome. Um, and then if it's, for example, if it's kind of what I, what I call classic or severe autism, parents will usually report differences even in their toddlers, like even, even a four-month-old. Um, you know, you'll see that they're, they're not as attached to their parents, and there's also some visual tracking work um, that shows that they don't track people the same way as other children. But really, you know, the most salient time when you can notice a difference is really when they're toddlers, um, two years old and, and, and up. And then, like, to be 100% sure where you have really a very high stability rate, it's, it's really more like three years old. Once, once a child's three, you can really tell with a high degree of accuracy. Two-year-olds, it's even a little difficult because they call it the terrible twos for a reason, which hmm. you're going to find out. <laughs> Um, so anyway, the, the point is that, you know, when a child's late, late talking and then they have tantrums, is that normal or is it autism? Because children with autism really have persistent tantrums and that's the challenge. Or is it, you know, a form of slow learning? And so it really takes a, a highly skilled clinician um, to be able to tell the difference there. Well, see, and you know what's tough about that. And the reason I wanted to ask is because as we're going to talk about and as your book, The Intuitive Parent, kind of discusses, a lot of parenting is... I mean, it's a scary thing. And a lot of it is you want the best for your kid, um, but obviously you worry. I mean, I asked my mom, does it ever go away? I'm 32 years old. No, it never goes away. So with that worry, when you say, look, it could be that they have autism or it could be that they're just late, that lends parents to say, well, then everything that goes wrong, I want to run it by a doctor right away. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, so yeah, I mean, you always you do you always care about your children. <laughs> you know, my oldest is thirty five, so you know, <laughs> never goes away. Although you know, we we have a sweet little granddaughter with them, so uh, you know, you focus a lot on the grandchildren. Right. So, being a grandparent's even better than being a parent. <laughs> being a parent is awesome. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of answer your question in two pieces. The first one is that you you know you talked about worry. Worry is kind of a part and parcel of being a parent, but I really worry I worry <laughs> that. Um, the worry factor is really ratcheting up in today's society. Mm. And I really see it as, as kind of being um, induced by several different factors. And one is how competitive our education system has become. So parents are really trying to push their children very early, um, trying to figure out you know, the very um, best way they can teach them. And that creates its own anxiety. And then also, um, you know, this real focus on early identification. Parents are really watching for any kind of signs of difference in their children. Um, and, and awareness is a good thing, but I also am concerned that it ends up causing a lot of worry. And the real bad thing about that is having a little baby, a four-month-old, um, you know, children at all ages, but particularly when they're really young, it's the, it's the coolest thing. It's so much fun. It's so wonderful. I have so many fabulous memories of my children when they were little. And I, I, I hate it that that's being stolen from parents. They're being you know, consumed by worry. And then, frankly, there's a lot of marketing you know, that's mm -hmm. pretty aggressive. You, know, you need to do this or that. And there's peer pressure. You know, should I be a tiger mother or a, you know, a helicopter mom? Should I be a free-range parent? And everything in between. And there's all, all this advice. It's almost like stimulus overload and then the child themselves it's like you can't really just be in the moment with the child mm -hmm. you know if you're thinking oh gosh i need to do this or that otherwise i'm missing a teachable moment and that that part of it is really why i wrote the book as you were saying that i mean so many things especially having my wife here with me um that we'll get to go through one is this idea you said of, of missing the moments with your child and so for me, oftentimes I'll be sitting with my son, just looking at him, just watching his amazing faces. And then I'll get this trigger that says, well, Chris, you read that babies need to be spoken to as often as possible. That's going to help their development. So then I start going, I have to talk to him, but I don't have anything to say. So I'll pull out a book and just start reading. And then I'll think, oh, I need to read him a more complicated book with words that are more difficult. And I feel like I'm doing something good for him. I'm providing this, you know, these these words and these stories, but it does add the stress. What level are you doing good versus doing harm? Yeah, a fabulous question. And, and your narrative is one that really is exactly what I'm talking about. So um, first off, I want to say that 
everything you did is good and helpful. I don't want you to feel like, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, I, I didn't do exactly what Dr. Camerata said, you know, I don't want you to feel that way. Because the reality is that there's a lot of variable things that, that children experience and it's all p helpful in terms of them learning and, and actually wiring their brains correctly. Really the very best thing you can do is when you're sitting there looking at his face is, you know, talk to him as you naturally would, you know. Um, I, I know when I'm looking at my little granddaughter's face, you know, I'm, I'm actually usually imitating her facial expressions and then, you know, kind of gurgling and, oh, you know, you're happy now and, you know, <laughs> things like that. And, and But the really the whole key to this and the essence of what's in the book, The Intuitive Parent, is you don't need to be you necessarily reading stories to a little four-month-old, you know, just just having them look at, look at the face like you're doing, holding them so they're facing you, and the sweet spots are about ten to twelve inches. That's where their eyes really focus, and that's where they can see well, which is a natural hole point for your arms. There's, you know, there's a lot of you know, kind of natural just architecture here that happens just because of you know how how Mother Nature kind of set things up to really facilitate your child. Anyway, so then you 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 smile at them, you talk to them. And it doesn't really matter exactly what you say, but it, that's the normal, natural interaction. And that, that seems like, well, gosh, it's not like, you know, reading a book or that kind of thing. But in reality, that's giving them information about speech processing. It's getting them started for vocabulary. It's getting them to emotionally attach to you. It's teaching them about turn-taking and social development. There's so much power in that event. It's easy to overlook how wonderful it is for your child. So when you sit there and he's making faces or you're making faces back, Pat yourself on the back as being an awesome dad because that's what's going to wire his brain and teach him and get, give him the foundation he needs. Now, you mentioned about, you know, I'm supposed to talk a lot. There's really kind of a misunderstanding. We do want you to talk to your baby, but it's not only the quantity, it's also the quality. And so the, the key event here is that when he does something, he looks at you, he smiles, that's a signal to you that, oh, I'm ready to learn. Say something to me. It, it's, you know, it's not like you have to be the leader, right? Really, this is an interaction or a partnership. And so the, the, the real key here and the part that's being lost, I think, with this emphasis on, you know, trying to guide your child and, and you know, like micromanage their, their learning is that we lose these moments, these partnerships, these interactions, which are really very important. So the quantity is not only important, but also the quality. And best quality is when your son initiates and you respond. You want to tune into that and not feel like that's a bad thing. That's actually a very powerful thing and a very positive thing. It's also a ton of fun. Yeah, I was going to say, that's the easy part, right? It is. And it's easy. That's the, that's the heck of it. The easy thing is actually a good thing. Well, and what's difficult sometimes, and, and I'm glad you talked about all the things they're learning, is what I love doing is just like saying nonsense to him, you know? I mean, if somebody was watching what I was doing, they'd go, this is a crazy person because you get so engaged in their face and what they're doing. But then I go, am I making him dumber by not using real words? Like, is he thinking, oh, we talk like in these crazy sounds. And then am I destroying his capacity to use real sounds, eventually real words? You're definitely not destroying the capacity. Um, to my knowledge, no one's done a scientific study to say, you know, are you know, real words better than non-words. Um, some of our own studies, we use non-words because we can control kind of the way they sound and then see kind of how, what's the most efficient thing. And kids, kids learn, you know, young kids learn non-words really well. We call them pseudo-words because they're word-like. But anyway, um, you're certainly not harming them by doing that. What's really cool is your little four-month-old, his little ears are actually tuned into all the different languages of the world. And so... It's not like he only distinguishes um, the sounds in English, the phonemes in English. He also has the capacity to, to distinguish Chinese sounds, tonal sounds, Thai, you know, French, you name it. Um, they have a they have a, even a broader capacity to do that. Little little uh, toddler, little um, um, babies have that ability. It kind of it gets less, um, it gets more restricted as they get to be about a year old and and, and on. But he's actually really tuned into all the nonsense that you're doing. And um, so yeah, fire away, enjoy it. Um, because really, what matters is kind of that syllable structure that I suspect you're talking with. You know. Kind of the, you may be going, Babu, Nama, you know, Daddy loves you, you know, and, and that's really what matters, the intonation pattern, the syllable structures, and then the different phonemes that are in there. That's what his ears need for now. Um, he doesn't need exactly fine-tuned input. That's not what he needs to get that little auditory cortex wired properly. He just needs you talking to him, and playing in that way is great. If you're enjoying it, um, and he's enjoying it, 
fantastic. Keep keep doing that. You're definitely not making him dumber. Stephen, with your background in speech, is mimicking the same sounds that your baby makes, is that aiding them or helping them in learning how to converse or learning like that he's communicating or can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, great mom question. I love it. Yes. Indeed. So when, when he says something, so first off his, the, his little mouth is different than yours. So he can make sounds you can't even make. So for example, his little soft pal can touch the top of his, of his voice box or his larynx. You can't because <laughs> your, your throat is a little bit longer relative to where the soft palate is. Um, so he, he, he might make a sound where those two things kind of get in proximation, which you can't do. Anatomically, you know, it's impossible. But, um, yeah, so imitating the sounds. And really what matters there is turn-taking. So if you think about our social attachment, you know, it's like him, him looking and maybe vocalizing and then you looking and vocalizing in response. So that's certainly the, the stage for, like you said, conversation and social interaction. So again, you know, it seems like just this natural, normal, um, you know, non-scientific type of interaction, but it's actually really powerful. Um, one of the little things I talk about in the book is that when you're doing that, you know, you're wiring his brain, but there's a study actually where it turns out he's also wiring your brain <laughs> to be responsive. He's actually uh, causing your brain to produce um, chemicals associated with pleasure and also activating some attachment centers in your brain. So, you know, you're wiring his brain, but he's also wiring your brain. So you definitely want to get involved in that. Now let's take a break for a quick message from our sponsor, lynda.com, one of our favorites. lynda.com is the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com, that's L-Y-N-D-A, dot com slash smart people. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious like you, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to master Excel, learn negotiation tactics, build a website, or boost your Photoshop skills. Go to lynda.com slash smart people. Feed that curious mind. So some of the courses I recommend, you've heard me talk about them in the past, but going paperless, start to finish, iPhone and iPad security fundamentals. That's a new one I just found, given that I'm new to this whole iPad thing, that helps. And then getting things done. Always need to get things done around here. Your lynda.com membership will give you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an industry expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, I want you to visit lynda.com slash smart people. Sign up for that free 10-day trial. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash smart people. Wow. Well, as you're kind of discussing things regarding the brain, that is an area I wanted to touch on because I had read the thing about, you know, newborns up until about a year can really understand any language in the world. And then we lose that ability. And and that instantly got me thinking about how much of a sponge these these young beings are. And then the fact that it goes away so that we can better interact with the environment that we're in and we're living in. What is the kind of neuroscience behind the baby brain that makes it so primed for learning and such a, a blank canvas that we can turn into anything? Sure. So um, I do. I'm not trying to correct you, but I, I please do. <laughs> so, yeah, they don't. They can't really understand the languages. Um, that finding is that they can notice differences in speech sounds. So, um, for example, um, in 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 Thai, if I say the word um, "pa" and then "pa," you know, those are the same in English. That "p," you know, one has an aspiration to it. The, you know, the heavy "h," and the other one doesn't. And the little, little, you know, pre-12 month old can perceive that difference. You won't really, you'll kind of put it in the same bin. So basically that because they hear their parents' language, it's like their own, you know, phonemic categories um, become like their parents essentially or what the input is. So it's a frequency thing. But when they first come into the world, they don't know if they're going to be born into a Japanese household or a French household or whatever it is, American. And so their, their ears are are, um, you know, able to detect those differences. And then once, because they hear so much of their parent language, then 
then those categories get narrow, you know, and that's what happens. So it's not that they can understand it, it's that they, they can process the sounds, essentially. Whereas, you know, as you get older, you can still process them, but it's, it's like they're kind of in your own language. Um, so anyway, I don't, I don't mean to spend a lot of time no. on that, but no. I don't, I don't want parents to think that their little six month old can understand Japanese. <laughs> hey, I mean, you never know. So yeah, it's cool if they could. Yeah. So what, yeah, what, talk about brain architecture. Yeah. So, it's really cool. So for a long time, um, people thought that, you know, babies were just kind of these incomplete little adults that kind of added pieces onto their brains as they grew up. And, um, a couple of decades ago, there was an amazing discovery that little Babies actually are born with more neurons and neural connections than adults, you know. So they have this, they have like, in a sense, this overabundance or this capacity um, to learn things. And, and their, their little brain is just waiting for input so it can kind of lay down the super highways for the neural connections and, you know, kind of get the, the, the brain cells to go where they're supposed to go. And so that input that we're talking about, that hearing your parents talk, seeing them, interacting, actually is guiding the neural um, process. Now, it doesn't have to be fine-tuned. Like you mentioned, you know, talking to them versus reading a book. It's not like you have to read a book to them when they're four months old to get the book reading centers wired. No, it's kind of an aggregate process. But what matters is exposure, and that's actually what, what kind of lays down the basic framework for, for the brain. And then when they get to be um, about three years old, that process is largely, you know, uh, complete. And it's actually... It's misleading because people say, oh, there's this critical period. I have to teach them everything they can by the time they're three. <laughs> well, I'm really glad that's not true because we charge people a lot of money to come here to Vanderbilt. And so we are counting on neuroplasticity to still be in place in the you know, 18, 19, 20-year-olds. Otherwise, we're taking their money on false pretenses. Um, so it's kind of the basic architecture um, is laid down, but it's not like everything has to be finished then. You know what? Okay, I'm so glad we went here. Here, here was my thought. So I read about how amazing the young brain is. And so I thought, well, if it's so amazing and can soak up all this stuff, let me throw as much at him as possible and to really utilize the, the flexibility, the neuroplasticity, the, the neurons, as you, as you mentioned. Let's throw it all at him so that I'm creating this massive base. And later, when he's a genius, I can say it was thanks to me. I intuitively, going to intuition, know that's not true, but I can't help it. Why is that not true? Yeah, um, well, actually, it is true. Um, All right. You know, so, um, and as far as genius goes, it obviously depends on how you define genius. Um, so the idea is that you do want to um, allow your child to have a lot of different experiences, and there's lots of reasons for doing that. Um, just aside from acclimation, like we talked about earlier, and acclimating to different people, um, yeah, the more the more different kinds of experiences the brain has, the the more ready it is to learn. But I think that the real challenge here is this notion that, um, for example, if I show them letters and numbers on a computer screen, that I'm somehow tipping the scales that that brain then is going to be good at numbers and letters when it's older. Because actually, you know, if you wire the brain to see numbers and letters on a computer screen and you don't really back it up with what's called dialogic reading where you sit like you're doing sitting and reading to your your four month old then those letters and numbers just be kind, become kind of a splinter skill they don't really get connected to meaning and language and reading comprehension so it's not just throwing things at them it's actually the context that matters and that's where intuitive parenting comes in because if you're sitting with your child and you're interacting with them you're actually doing what I said which is giving them all these experiences showing them things when they look at something you can name it when they point at something your 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 little four month old will start pointing in the next few months even now though when he looks at something you can name it for him mm -hmm. you're actually doing exactly what you're saying you're making that brain really ready to take in information now the other piece that I think gets short change nowadays with this idea to just throw everything at them is the uh, ability to problem solve okay people who are considered gen genius means lots of things you know we might look at Picasso as a genius because he was able to express art in a certain way um, you know we might look at Marie Curie who won two Nobel prizes I mean my goodness you know um, you know how amazing is that but what they sh what they share Albert Einstein what they share is this this um, ability to um, problem solve and reason and have new insights and what I worry about is that parents nowadays are so focused on you know like naming things or doing vocabulary and that 
this ability to problem solve isn't necessarily being nurtured in the same way. So, you know, my advice to you is, yeah, throw everything at him, but also give him the opportunity to explore the world and learn things on his own. And, you know, when he when he's, you know, crawling around and, and, and knocking into toys and things or knock something down, give him a chance to kind of understand that. Don't necessarily show him what to do. Let him figure out what to do. That's the part that's being short short changed is we try to kind of micromanage development. So yeah, have him give give him experiences, but also give him the opportunity to learn and also to make mistakes. It's very important. Yeah, I, I read this quote from you and it said, you know, parents should never treat their baby's developing brain as a memory hard drive to download rote information. Rather, parents should be learning guides. And I love that because as part of my job, I do facilitation and it's based around adult learning theory. But really, that goes to show, at least the way I interpret it, that facilitation is just a human learning process. And we need to remember that when interacting with three months old, three year olds or 30 year olds. That's exactly right. Well said. Um, yeah, facilitation. I, I hadn't really thought of that word, but really, that's exactly right. It's it's really a matter of, you know, parents being partners, you know, um, not treating their child like a, a hard drive. You know, if you think about a hard drive, it has lots of information and it can give it back to you, but it can't really use it in a creative or productive way. And that's what I worry is happening to our children with this real push to try and get everything wired before they're three, which, again, is really a misunderstanding of what neuroscience tells us. As as we talk about this, and, and I can hear all the type A or tiger moms out there going, okay, I get this, but I still want my child to be exceptional. And that's kind of what I think. I get that I can do certain things. I can be here for him. I can love him. But what can I do that gives me that edge? You know, there's got to be something. I have you on the phone. How do I turn him into the the student, the young man the person in society. Yeah, well, actually. If you tell me, by the way, you're, uh, you know. I tell you, but you may not, you may not like this. Oh, one. no. So one of the things that, so a couple of things. First off, the best advice I can give you is to understand that every child has their own individual pattern of strengths and weaknesses. And what you really want to do is if they show an interest and an aptitude for something, let them go as far and as fast as they can. You know, if they show a propensity for um, quantity and numbers and putting things together, and <laughs> my condolences as if your son is this way, taking things apart, <laughs> um, you know, give them every opportunity to do that, you know, so that they, you know, they, they nurture their gifts in some ways, and you're nurturing their gifts, right? If you think about genius, it's really pretty, pretty focused, right, on, on an ability. Uh, it could be, could be math, science, arts, whatever it is, but you know, like, um, you know, Picasso drew and drew and drew when he was when he was young. I can only imagine him in today's society. They probably would li like not let him draw because they would say he's just too obsessed with it, right? You know. Um, so, and his own story is is an interesting one. I recommend you read his biography at some point. But uh, anyway, um, the long and the short of it is that you know it's not about like making every child hit every developmental milestone on time. It's about seeing their own individual gifts and nurturing those. Like uh, one of one of my sons um, is, was really a good artist, right? He he liked to draw and he would draw comics and things like when when he was younger. And so we you know we did everything we could to try to nurture that. Even though my wife and I, my wife's a pretty decent artist. I'm terrible. My kids save my Pictionary pictures to show their friends to show you know here's this professor who draws up like a kindergartner. You know, <laughs> I have no artistic <laughs> aptitude whatsoever. Um, so each of us has has strengths and weaknesses, and you want to get into that, okay? And that's the point. You want to be re you want to be reacting to your child, not necessarily saying, "Okay, I'm going to make my child a genius in physics from day one." That may not necessarily be their strong suit. Or I'm going to make my you know my child the world's greatest golfer. You know, for every um, you know golfer that that started when they were two, there's thousands that their parents started them off and they just didn't didn't have that aptitude. You know, and that's a trade off. They really they really shouldn't have maybe been spending all that time on golfing. You know. Um, so the idea is to really get, you know, again, pay attention to your child, see what they're good at, and then and then nurture that. Okay, so you don't, and again, you can't really necessarily cram them into the genius mold. Now, the second part of this is that when you read the biographies of geniuses, and I, I hope you do, um, they're not the easiest kids to raise yeah. because they're very strong-willed. 
like uh, as I was reading uh, Tiger Mother, I was thinking about um, Arthur Rubinstein, who was, uh, you know, an amazing, um, you know, musician. And, uh, you know, his parents wanted him to play the violin, and, and he actually smashed the violin. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't going to do that. So uh, I could just imagine, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Chua, you know, getting a, a Rubinstein and, and trying to Tiger Mother him. You know, good luck with that. <laughs> um, Oppenheimer, who uh, it was headed up the Manhattan Project that led to the um, development of the atomic bomb, um, he would not sit in his seat in class. Um, you know, he, he would walk around and he would do the work that he was interested in, but he wouldn't do the work the teachers wanted him to do. And so this is a kind of a, you know, a theme that we, we keep seeing. Um, Edward Teller and Albert Einstein both didn't start talking until they were two or in Teller's case three. So they may not even talk, you know, and, um, you can only imagine me what would happen to them in today's society. So yeah, having a really gifted, uh, uh, creative genius child is really cool. But it also has its downside in terms of the kids are really strong will. Okay, Stephen, tell my husband one more time that uh, we cannot force our son to be a professional golfer. Um, yeah, <laughs> you, 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 he, if you introduce him to golf, he'll probably be better at it than other children because you introduce it to him early. But it won't, it won't necessarily make him a professional golfer. Um, now, my one, my one. Um, Exception to that is if he's left-handed, you can make him a left-handed pitcher. Yeah. <laughs> if he's a 500 left-handed pitcher, he can make millions of dollars. See? I, I'm being facetious here, but anyway. Uh, but, I was going to say, you're right there with me. Yeah, <laughs> no, I know. So, no, it's, it's, uh, it's giving him opportunities, you know. And the thing is, I mean, it's like right now, um, you know, you can't necessarily imagine what your son is going to grow into and what he's going to want to do or even what kind of jobs there's going to be in the society he grows up in. And so... If you try to really um, narrowly put him in a certain bin, that may actually end up kind of backfiring on you in terms of stunning his intellectual growth. And, and the gifts that he actually has may not necessarily get nurtured. So you want to you want to be very thoughtful and, and um, insightful in, in your, um, your attempts to uh, make him, say, a, a world-class golfer. Hmm. Smart People Podcast is supported by Wealthfront, the automated investment service that makes it easy to invest your money the right way. Wealthfront software manages your money using investment strategies that were previously only available to the wealthiest investors for just one quarter of the cost of using a traditional advisor. Wealthfront monitors your account 24-7, automatically rebalancing your portfolio, reinvesting dividends, and working to maximize your after-tax returns. Wealthfront is also overseen by a team of investment experts, the same experts who launched the index fund revolution and who have written some of the most important books in finance. In case you're still not convinced, you should know that Wealthfront manages over $2 billion in client assets and have saved millions of dollars on taxes for its clients. So with Wealthfront watching over your investments every day, what will you do with all your extra time? Visit Wealthfront.com slash smart people to get your first $10,000 managed for free. That's Wealthfront.com slash smart people. Thank you, Wealthfront, for supporting Smart People Podcast. Wealthfront, Inc. is an SEC-registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are offered through Wealthfront Brokerage Corporation, member FINRA and SIPC. This is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Investing in securities involves risks, and there is a possibility of losing money. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Please visit wealthfront.com to read their full disclosure. That's a, it's a really good point when you when you mention how different his environment will be by the time he's kind of thrown out into the thrown out into the cold harsh world. Um and I wonder if a lot of the issues we're having now as you mentioned with anxiety and worry and competitiveness and being a parent and then what we might uh, do incorrectly or worry about is coming from the fact that, you know, we were raised in this world of where memorization was hands down the thing that you had to get first because you couldn't just go to Google. And now as we're transitioning into that, it's becoming much more of a knowledge economy. You need to be able to solve hard problems, figure out solutions and, and kind of be creative and we don't know how to teach that because we ourselves haven't been taught that. Yeah, boy, you really made it a very important point. So um, there's a, a genius named uh, Talat who can remember uh, numbers. And in fact, he's 
he's recited tens of thousands of digits of pi. You know, it's a, pi is a um, a unique number that has non-repeating decimals. And uh, but you know, now I can go to Google and get a hundred thousand digits of pi <laughs> you know, in less than a minute. Um, you know, and so. That yeah, that that focus on memory is less important. Our 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 smartphones are our memories. Thank right. God, as I get older, you know, yeah, it does does roll off a bit as you get older. Um, but yeah, so that kind of thing is no longer going to be something that's as valuable in society. What's going to be valuable is the ability to think and reason and take the information that's available and use it in practical ways or in novel ways. In the case of what we're talking about with genius, so that's why I'm I'm saying. It's interesting. This modern movement really is kind of going, in my, from my way of thinking, the wrong direction. We're 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 making our kids in the little hard drives and memorizing. When in fact, the stock and trade in the in the world is going to be increasingly less of that and more on the ability to reason. So we're we're kind of shortchanging the reasoning and thinking side in our children and emphasizing memorization. And we do that for testing or early education or you know getting a spot in a gifted program or whatever it is. But in reality, in the long run, we may actually be kind of going in the wrong direction in that regard. That's one of the reasons I emphasize thinking so much uh, in the book. Stephen, um, I don't know if you knew that I'm a kindergarten teacher. Oh, so, you know, just to touch on early childhood education, um, there is a big push um, for, you know, the problem solving and project based learning and um, things like that in our school. And I, I love it as a teacher teaching children that way makes more sense almost to me. Yeah, your insight is exactly right. And, you know, kindergartners, kindergarten teachers just really have such great insight into kids because, you know, you run and you get a, a handful of, by the way, kindergarten is what, four, five, and six-year-olds, right, depending. Right. Uh, yeah. and, and those are very different ages. Big all. range, yeah. Yeah. So they're very good at tuning into their children. My mother-in-law was a kindergarten teacher, and then my own kindergarten teacher was just wonderful, Miss Beeman. She was just this really kindly. Um, we elder. always remember our kindergarten teachers, we do. right? We do. <laughs> you know, so you're going to be, you know, everyone's going to remember you. That's <laughs> um and it's um, it's good. I'm so happy to hear that you're you're kind of embracing um, that notion. And and the thing that's important too is that you know some of those that I've seen, there's kind of a script for the problem base. And what's what's and that's fine. I think it's good to you know have a, have a set of steps that lead them to a certain outcome. But it's also really important to let the kids be creative and have their own solution to the problem. Right. You know that doesn't necessarily fit the teaching manual. So um, I love it. You're doing that and. I'll I'll see your problem solving and and raise you one you know saying you know some kid's gonna absolutely um, you know come up with a, a a solution from out in left field and um, nurture that too right. you know <laughs> well it's I bet you do I bet you are actually I mean yeah. it's honestly one of the reasons I married her because I, I was like I have no chance in uh, doing this whole child rearing thing so I better get somebody who knows how but you know one thing that I notice and and Heather and I talk about it is the ADHD epidemic. And I know you cover that. And it's always a hot topic. I know friends of mine, you know, 30 year olds that are just now being diagnosed with some type of ADD because of the way society and and just the workplace are. I mean, I know I can't even work without two monitors now. I have 40 tabs open and I feel my attention span just increasingly shrinking, my ability to focus shrinking. You know, if I'm not checking a phone or a screen, I feel the anxiety when I do the dopamine boost. So what is it that is happening to our children early on? And how can, you know, new parents or even parents of of children who might already be struggling, how can they help set their child up in the best position to not have those types of quote unquote learning disabilities? Yeah, so um, I'm going to speak specifically to ADHD, um, and I can also talk about more broad learning, broader learning disabilities as well, if you wish. Um, so the thing about ADHD, first off, it's real. Um, you know, it's not a made-up category. I certainly encounter children um, who, um, you know, they have a lot of difficulty inhibiting distractors. In fact, that's how you you, you screen for it in the young children. They'll be engaged in an, in an activity and they're really focused on something and then a little bit of a movement or something, even the peripheral visual field then, you know, completely derails their ability to focus and have attention. Or they're sitting there and they're engaged in something that's 
really, really motivating, and they have to get up and move every minute or less. You know, so there there is you know a real condition. On the other hand, um, you know, uh, one of the things that's happening is because, and 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 you may see this in your kindergarten. Um, you know, we expect children to kind of sit still and listen at young ages, and there's a, a a lot of children that really aren't ready to learn that way. It's not really their natural learning style, right. and so um, they may be they may move and be wiggly, and it's really kind of only the school where you see those symptoms. And so one of the things I worry about talking about in the book is you know being sure that it really is ADHD as opposed to a child whose learning style doesn't necessarily match up with the teaching environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a lot of the schools, because they're under a lot of pressure to do well. And by the way, I, I have total admiration for teachers. I'm not criticizing teachers at all in this thing, right? They're, they're kind of playing the hand they're dealt. Um, but they have to teach a certain amount of material in a certain way in a certain time, regardless of whether their child's ready for it. And so I really worry that, um, you know, that a, a large percentage of the kids that we see as ADHD, in fact, really, it's more of a mismatch between their learning style and what, what we're expecting them to learn and how we're teaching them. I couldn't agree with you more, really. I totally believe that in my classroom, you know, kids come in and they learn in all different ways. They come in knowing all different you know, that's just such a wide range, like you said before. And um, I do think there is a bit of misdiagnosis due to learning style, for sure. Another, another and following up on that, and, and thank you for saying that. Um, and again, many teachers have expressed that to me. And there was a wonderful, I mentioned the book, a wonderful letter to the editor of the New York Times expressing that from a long-term teacher. Um, the other piece to this, though, and I'm, this is, um, I, I can't prove this with science. This is really more of a clinical observation. What I've seen is that um, a lot of children um, get medicated early on so they can, you know, um, do the worksheets and sit there, sit still and listen, kind of, sort of. And so, in a way, they don't really learn how to adapt their, um, their kind of their attention and focus, um, you know, to their unique set of abilities, their unique learning style. And so then they grow up and they've kind of been medicated and they've learned, kind of learned how to be in school or, or they may be figured that they're losers in the ac- academic arena when they really could be winners. Um, and then, you know, they hit adulthood, like, like you were saying, and, you know, they don't really necessarily even have the ability to adapt or accommodate their learning difference or their, their unique style. Like, to me, when you were talking about looking at several screens, I'm thinking, hey, cool, you know, that's, <laughs> that's great you can process information that way. I, I can only look at one screen at a time. Uh, it, uh, you know, great. You could you could do more than I can. You know, and but you you I think you're feeling it stress wise because you're trying to integrate a bunch of information right. forces simultaneously, um, which is you know competing uh, attention is actually a very interesting scientific area, um, and uh, how attention works in the brain is also fascinating. But yeah, I think you know again, it's a real challenge because we're really trying to um, you know treat children like they're automobiles on an assembly line. <laughs> You know, and whether they're ready to have that steering wheel bolted on or not, we're trying to bolt it on. And that's really a big problem, you know. We really want to kind of hit the children where they are developmentally and also understand that no no child is at the same developmental phase across all learning domains. Right. Some might be better in math, some might be better in reading. And we want to meet them where they are to the extent we can within a regularized education system. But somehow, previous generations were able to do this and... It seems like we're less able to do it today where we're just, boy, you know, you're in second grade. You've got to be at grade level on every subject, whether you're ready or not. And then on the other hand, kids who are really ready to go ahead and maybe when they're in second grade can do third or fourth grade math or third or fourth grade reading, we're not really letting them go ahead. Um, I know one little guy um, that I work with, he um, he talked late. Um, and he was really good in, in math. And uh, when he was in fourth grade, I got a call and they, you know, they were saying he had behavior problems. He's like, no, nah, this wasn't, I mean, you know, I work with kids with behavior problems, including some of my own children sometimes, mm-hmm. but especially teenagers. Mm-hmm. Can't wait till you have that. <laughs> um, you know, but I mean, all, all teasing aside, this wasn't a kid who would really be have challenging behavior, you know. And it turned out that, you know, he was in fourth grade, they were letting him do fifth grade math. Well, he was actually ready to do eighth and ninth grade math, right? And so they were, in a sense, were creating the behavior problem. And I, I told the teacher, I said, look, if I made you, do worksheets on addition and subtraction, you know, 
you would be so bored, you would be telling jokes, you would be ripping up your papers and doing the things he was doing. Mm -hmm. He said to solve this problem, just he's ready for geometry, let him do geometry, he will not bother anybody. But they weren't allowed to do that. They weren't allowed him to work ahead of his skill level. And so on the one hand, we're <laughs> expecting the, some children to work above what they know, so it just becomes a memorization situation or a splinter skill. Mm -hmm. Other kids are ready to go ahead and we're not letting them go ahead so they're bored to tears. Right. That's really not good for anybody. It's definitely that dreaded uh you know the the testing and standardized testing. It's Yeah. I guess so I take test too and I gotta tell you, that whole idea is really crazy because the test makers are always developing new items that are designed to stay ahead of the game. And so it becomes a vicious cycle. Right. So when parents teach, when have their kids memorize items, the test makers are coming along with a whole bunch of new items they've never seen before. Mm -hmm. You can't win in that game. That that will not work because test test making is a big business. Right. And, uh, you know, and it, like I said, they're constantly collecting data and creating new items. When 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 people have memorized a set of items or solutions, they're going to replace those pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. that's not a good way to do it. You want to. You want to teach your children how to think through uh, and problem solve so when they get new types of things, they can reason through it as opposed to just trying to do real memorization. I was mildly aware of this, but until we spoke to somebody who kind of uh, really urged against it, what are the harms of watching TV for young, very young children? And to what extent? So, like, I used to love when, when my son was really small, like a month old, He'd fall asleep on my chest, and I, it'd be midnight, and I'd watch some TV. And then I was told, look, he shouldn't be anywhere near it. He shouldn't hear it. He shouldn't see the flashing lights. And so now it becomes really restrictive, at least on my schedule. So I want to get both what we should do and then why it's so bad, if so. Yeah, right, yeah. Okay, so so bad is an overstatement. So your son falling asleep on your stomach, how wonderful is that? I have so it's many. The, it's that, unreal. Yeah, it just brought back so many great memories. Um, but, um, yeah, if you're watching TV when he falls asleep, um, it's not going to hurt him. I mean, at least there's no evidence it's going to hurt him. Um, what people worry about is, um, so there, there's this notion of imprinting, um, and uh, I'm not, I'm not spend a lot of time talking about what it is, but... Um, you know, it's really important that children become imprinted, little babies become imprinted on human faces and human voices, and that they're three-dimensional rather than two-dimensional, and that has to do with how the brain gets wired. And so there's recommendations about screen time um, in the literature. Um, so in a sense, you know, what you want to do is make sure that, um, you know, you're not basically wiring that child's brain to, um, you know, basically process TV and and TV sound and all that kind of thing. You know, you really want it to be 3D human, and really you want it to be the parents. And so that's why people are recommending limiting screen time. On the other hand, you know, um, there are people who are really kind of very anti-technology at all for, for um, you know, toddlers. And so um, really, you know, my recommendation, and again, I can't prove this as data, it's a recommendation, um, is that you treat the technology like it's a book, Right. And so what you don't want to do is just have the child sitting there, you know, kind of by themselves, interacting with the iPad or watching a TV by themselves or whatever it is. You want it to be an interactive process. So in other words, it's fine to, you know, for example, maybe read a story off of the iPad and just hold your child and do it like you do it would in a normal book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so the technology itself is fine as long as you don't think of the technology as being the teacher, right? You want to think of the technology as a tool. Just like a book is a tool for accessing information. And so it's, it's, it's that, you know, there's this notion that, you know, you want to have a baby genius video and you just park your kid in front of that and then they'll be the next Einstein. Right. Well, that actually is really misleading and not true. The studies on that actually show that they, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this, they actually are less social and less intelligent because their vocabularies don't build as much as when you're interacting with them and as human beings in real time. So you're actually, you're making them baby, not genius. I'll say it that way. Um, so yeah, you really want to use the technology as you would any other toy or device. You don't want it just to be something that, that drives the learning. You want it to be one other thing in the child's world that they encounter where you're reacting to them and you're guiding them and you're being a partner for them. So interact with them and, you know, they're going to see you using your phone and all the rest of it. It's like you can't really stop that from happening. Right. What you don't want is them in the car seat, you know, zoning out, watching the TV or the iPad or whatever it is because 
they're not only wiring their brain for that, they're also missing other three-dimensional learning opportunities with toys and, and things like that. Sure. So there's a up there too. No, that's great. And I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for being on the show. Again, the book, The Intuitive Parent, Why the Best Thing for Your Child is You, um, brand new, hasn't even come out as of this recording um, although when this goes live, it probably will. So congratulations on that. And thanks for being on. I wanted to give you a chance. Is there, um, anywhere else that do you write or do you, you know, do social media, any websites that you could share? So, um, I'm, I've been, uh, I'm a newest, uh, blogger on psychology today. Um, and so I, people can go to psychology today and, and look that up. Um, and then, um, I have another book called Late Talking Children, so they're, they're welcome to look at that, particularly if they have a child who's not, you know, not talking and they're looking for answers. Um, and um, so I'd, I'd have them uh, look up for that if, they, if it's something that would be helpful to them. And then the last word I want to have is, you know, pay attention to your children and enjoy them. Do not let all this steal the wonderful, wonderful times you're going to have with your baby. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Stephen Camerata. Yet another first for Smart People Podcast, bringing additional interviewers into the fold. I hope you enjoyed that one. If you enjoyed this episode or any previous episode of Smart People Podcast, please head over to iTunes or Stitcher. Leave a rating, review, comment over there. If you do any of those, it greatly helps the show. Helps us get recognition on iTunes, moves us up the chart. So thank you in advance to those that are leaving reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. Don't forget about Stitcher. Chris mentioned it in the intro, but it bears repeating. If you need help setting up a podcast, you can reach out to us. Just go to the website consulting.smartpeoplepodcast.com. Drop us a line. We'll get in touch with you and help you out. If you need to reach out to the show, send us an email at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. Or message us on Twitter at Smart People Pod. We've got a lot of great guests coming up, so stay tuned and we will see you all next week. Mm-hmm.